Welcome to Distinti Sci-Fi Review. In my travels, I listen to a lot of science fiction audio novels. And I've had the great opportunity to come across The End of Eternity. And in this book, Asimov gives a dire warning about the lack of development of faster-than-light starship drive. The End of Eternity asserts that a delay in development of faster-than-light starships will relegate the human race to an inferior place in the cosmos and lead to eternal stagnation. Now, where does the end of eternity fit in the Asimov universe? Well, what we need to do is then take a look at what's called the Foundation Series. In the Foundation Series, the humans inhabit the galaxy. There's a galactic empire of millions of worlds. It spans the entire Milky Way galaxy and is sustained by faster-than-light starships. And it's an amazing concept. Now, the book, because it was started as a bunch of short stories in the 40s and was finally put into a coherent book in 1951, it may seem like a little bit of a dry story to us today because there's a lot of lack of things like computers and personal data assistant and cell phones because they really weren't understood. But what's a really ground-shaking about this book is the concept of the Galactic Empire, a concept that other movies like Star Wars ad adapted and inherited and the concept of this city here called Trantor, where the entire surface of the planet is covered by a city. And the only place of the planet that has, you know, green grass and vegetation and trees is the palace of the emperor. Okay, so it's an amazing concept on a scale nobody had ever thought of before. And that's what makes this an epic novel to begin with, even though it didn't really have all the things we kind of expect in the modern day stuff. Okay. And the way it goes, the, the, for 12,000 years, the Galactic Empire has ruled supreme. Now it is dying. But only Harry Sheldon, creator of the revolutionary science of psychohistory, can see into the future to a dark age of ignorance, barbarism, and warfare that will last 30,000 years. To preserve the knowledge and save mankind, Sheldon gathers the best minds in the empire, both scientists and scholars, to bring them to a bleak planet at the edge of the galaxy, to serve as a beacon of hope for future generations, and he calls this sanctuary the foundation. Okay, his idea, because he can see into the future, is to use history and mathematics and science to mitigate, to minimize the dark ages, and to reduce the dark ages from 30,000 years just to 1,000 years. Okay, and then this original Foundation trilogy spans over three books that are written each successive year, but the books span over a thousand years, and you can see here's Trantor in its prime. Here's Trantor after a couple of hundred years, it's starting to be in rubble. And here's Trantor after like five or six hundred years, where all the buildings in the back are just relics of their former selves. It's an epic novel, it spans thousands of years. Then, after this, okay, this is from the 1950s, uh, Asimov decided to write some more installments in the 1980s. And so we have Foundation's Edge and, uh, oops, uh, and Foundation and Earth. That should have been 1986. And then we have, so these are the sequels, and now we have two prequels. Prelude to Foundation and Forward the Foundation. Again, I forgot to update the little text. So then what happened was an epiphany. Okay, during the two-year lapse between writing the sequels and the prequels, Asimov had tied his Foundation series with his various other series, creating a single unified universe. The basic link is mentioned in Foundation's Edge, an obscure tradition about robots and blah, 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 blah. And it was brilliant. And it's absolutely brilliant. So now what we have here is he has linked all of the books of all of his works pretty much together as a single description from man first leaving space to uh, short-term galactic travel, all the way to hyperspace galactic travel, all the way to, to the end. And it, it, it is fantastic. And it's amazing how even though most of these stories are written as independent things, they somehow worked. I mean, there's certain things in the timeline that are that, that they call out that don't work right. But hey, you know, uh, it was a brilliant idea to work it all together. And so... Where does the end of eternity fit in this entire Asimov universe now? Well, let me start off by giving you a little synopsis of the end of eternity. If you want to go read the book now, you better stop here. 
Okay, so in the early 20th century, this starts before the entire galactic timeline or the, the other series, um, is that time travel is discovered and then the Eternity Project is formed. Its mission is to end the misery, suffering, and chaos in humanity, both past, present, and future, by intervening in historical events. Like, you often hear people say, well, if we could go back and, and kill Adolf Hitler and prevent World War II, blah, 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 that, that's the kind of the premise of the book. But they realize after a while that they can't do big things like that. They have to do little things. Okay, there's a whole philosophy they develop in the book of how they do that without affecting history too much, but reducing misery. Okay, but the byproduct of the intervention of the development of Fast and Light Starship Drive is delayed for a considerable time. Because think about it, Fast and Light Starship Drive, first thing people are going to use this technology for is weapons and use it for war. And so it always ends up being on the wrong side of the mission of the Eternity Project. And that's why it's delayed for centuries and centuries and centuries. I think it's thousands of years. I've never got the exact timeline. So how does this whole thing fit into the... Asimov timeline. Well, it actually turns out that it's an alternate timeline to the entire series. And that's interesting because the original book started actually in the 1940s. And the last installment of the Foundation series was written in 1993. And the End of Eternity was written in 1955. And it was never intended to be an alternative timeline of this, but it works beautifully as an alternative timeline, almost as if it was written that way to begin with. Uh, and they actually have, I don't have, think I have the books in the right order here. There's a link that has all the books in the order they should be read if they're going to read them in chronological order. It doesn't really matter. As long as you understand the thing, you can kind of read them in any order, as long as you know where they fit in the timeline. And I'll put this link out, so if you want to read them in that order, you can do that. And so the interesting thing is to span from the beginning of the Galactic Empire series, that's what I'm going to call it for short, is approximately 20,000 years where the eternity is essentially eternity. That's the span of this book. From the beginning of time to the destruction of the earth, essentially that's what, um, from the beginning of the earth to the destruction of the earth. Okay, so what happens is, is as the story goes on, because humans have not developed faster than light starships, the other species in the galaxy evolve and they start to inhabit and colonize the galaxy. And when mankind finally gets starship drive, there is nowhere else to go. Everything is taken. And we have we are since we are so far behind the line, we have no ability to push anybody off. We're just this this knucklehead race that you know spun our wheels for years. And so what happens is the uh, the humans just stagnate on the earth because they have nowhere else to go. So in an earlier part of the book. A thousand centuries, a hundred thousand centuries into the future and beyond exist barriers that the Eternity Project cannot access. These are called the hidden centuries. The hidden centuries are inhabited by a highly advanced society of humans that develop a supremely more advanced understanding of time. And these hidden century people see the future of stagnation and realize they must end the Eternity Project, which of course is going to destroy them as well. And so it goes like this. If you end the Eternity Project and all time travel, then you'll revert back to the Galactic Empire timeline. You'll prevent the stagnation of humanity. You'll allow fast and light starships to develop, and you'll restore the Galactic Empire and human dominance over the galaxy. Because essentially, we get there first, and we keep all the other species from evolving. Now, you can have some philosophical problems with that, but, I mean, this is the story. And it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant dovetailing. And it wasn't intended to be that way, but it works out as a brilliant dovetailing. Because in the foundation, the heroes use knowledge of the past to fix the future. And in the end of eternity, the heroes use the knowledge of the future to fix the past. It's a beautiful dovetail. It's just bringing the hairs on my back and my neck standing up, how brilliant this was. And what's really, really cool, which I just learned as I started looking for getting pictures for this, is that Apple announced it's going to make the Foundation series. And you can look for the trailers. And I'm going to put the links to the trailer. They have a trailer, but there's also somebody made a synopsis. I'm going to put the link down there for that, too, where they cut together splices from other science fiction movies and then overlay that with the voice from the audio novel 
And um, it's really well done. It, it, it flows nicely and it gives you a synopsis of what the gist of the book is, at least the first found, the foundation novel. Okay, so to recap, Asimov asserts that a delay in the development of FTL starships will relegate human race to an inferior place in the cosmos and relegate us to eternal stagnation. And this dovetails with my T1 video. And I'm going to put the link down there for the T1 video too, where I use an art logical argument to say unless we can break the speed of the slight barrier by a factor of 500, we will not survive. I need your help. The survival of the human race and the ecosystem of the Earth may depend on it. I'm an engineer, and 20 years ago I stumbled upon anomalies in science that suggest that a great portion of modern scientific theories are wrong, and I'll announce an example at the end. My work suggests that phenomena like time dilation and length contraction have simple mundane explanations which can be worked around making fast and light starships a reality. And you can go to my website and see my transvariance paper. I'll have links in the low bar at the end of this video. And you ask, well, why is faster than light starship so important for saving the Earth and humanity? Well, in the T1 trailer, I do a logical back of the napkin engineering calculation to say that if we don't break the light barrier as far as travel, starship travel, by a factor of 500, then the human race will not soon survive. Because if you think about it, unless we can get people off the planet in large numbers, okay, we have all of our eggs in one basket. We're one plague away from extinction. We're one atomic war away from extinction. We're one asteroid or super volcano impact from extinction. And 500 times the speed of light is the only way that multiple human colonies can support and self-sustain each other, to offer help to each other. But if we don't break the light barrier, then the only other option we have to live sustainably on the earth is to purge a large number of the population. Because when the oil runs out, Okay, then the only way that we can feed this planet is to go back to an 1800 style agrarian existence. And all you have to do to get my number, uh, I came about it a completely different way, is just take 40 acres and a mule. That was an old expression for how much a four person family would need. And take the land area of the earth, divide it by 40 acres, and then multiply it by four. And that number is going to be a little bit larger than the number I came up with. Okay, I came up with 80% purge as a bare minimal existence. Agenda, uh, Agenda 21 released their numbers and they say 75% purge. And my 90% purge was out there because that would be a comfortable living. So either we get 90% of the population off the planet and help also protect the ecosystem because if we don't, we're basically going to take the entire ecosystem of the earth and shove it out our buttholes. We need to reduce the load on the earth so the earth ecosystem and us can both survive because if the earth ecosystem doesn't survive we don't survive we're entwined we need to start reducing population and you got two options you got the distinct solution is we build faster than light starships and start colonizing other planets or you've got the the UN agenda 21 which requires a 75 percent purge to demonstrate that I'm right and the rest of physics is completely with their head up their butthole at 11 a.m. Eastern on August 1st, 2020, I'll release a short video that explains where the dark matter is. The answer is so ridiculously simple that everyone, everyone, including five-year-olds and kindergartners, can understand, to understand it and it'll embarrass the entire body of physics and astronomy. Oh, of course, they're going to complain that I'm wrong because their paychecks are on the line, of course. However, you'll be able to see how simple the explanation is, so you be the judge and support this cause. See, I've been supporting this project on my own for decades because I was never really asked for anybody's money because I was never quite sure, and the breakthroughs are kind of far and few between. But in 2017, I had, by analyzing energy and peeling back the onions of energy, I was able to confirm my initial belief as being right, and that's when I started my Patreon site. Recently, in the past few months, working on the electrogravity paper, which is going to be released in the next months, which, which has the solution for the dark matter in it, I came to the second way of corroborating what my fundamental core beliefs are right. 
and things are starting to happen quicker and quicker and quicker. And I need help. I can't do it all. I need your support on Patreon so I can do this full time. Hire video producers because I know I don't like listening to my videos because I, I really suck at making videos. And if I can get you know, talented people to make the videos and web design and managers to take care of my poor patrons. I am so sorry, my patrons. I know I've been neglecting you, but you're great. You, you understand that this takes a lot of time. And it's hard to do it all, especially since I'm doing it in my free time away from my full-time job, which is my number one way of supporting this project right now. So I want to be able to concentrate on the science full-time to capitalize on the breakthroughs. So please help. You can go to my website, distinti.com. It's not perfectly laid out. It's what I can do in the little amount of time I've got. Uh, you'll see the overview of the Ethereum Mechanics Project. There's some free papers there. We have the ethereummechanics.com Patreon site. Please, for as little as $5 a month, you can become a passenger to the stars and you can see the insider videos of things. Some things are never released to the public. Others will be released at a later time. So in other words, the patrons will have a first shot. The only, and the other video, the other site is the blog site where there's a lot of people collaborating on trying to come up with detectors and devices and we're going to be a collab better collaboration of the Ethereum Mechanics Project going forward. They'll be ramping this up soon. Uh, these are the links. I'm going to put these links. I put them here so I wouldn't forget them. I'm going to put these in the low bar. Thank you.